Some stories in the Bible go with the pattern, you listen to God and you're blessed. Last week we saw what happened. Jacob didn't listen. He wasn't forgiving, he wasn't loving, and he ran away. And, and we got to see what happened. But we saw the death that came to a whole people. We saw that his daughter was raped. And then we saw what happened when he didn't offer forgiveness. Tonight's story is the complete opposite. It's as though he gets to remake that choice. And he's going to remake the choice, and instead of going away from his brother, he's now going to go back to his brother. Genesis 35. Genesis 35. Starting in verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and live there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. Let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God. Who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had, and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which he was near Shechem. As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities that were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. He built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and she was buried below Bethel under the oak. It was named Alan Bacuth. So everything right here is starting to go really well. God is saying, I'm gonna, I want you to go back to Bethel. I want you to go back to where you had the chance to go with your brother and you fled. Your brother came out with his army, you came out with yours, and you said, and you know, give us a little time, you know, we're slow and moving, and you went the other direction. You had that chance to be reconciled to your brother, and you didn't do it. And so God says, go back to Bethel, where you, where you made this choice to flee from your brother. Where, where you originally made this covenant with me, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to be with you, you need to, and so Jacob decides, I'm going to do the right thing. And not only does he do what God says, he puts away all the other idols he'd acquired. He tells everybody in the camp, let's get right. And he, and he starts to praise God and he says, this is where God had done something great for me and where I built an altar to praise him. And so he, he responds this way to God and God responds in turn. In verse 9, he says, Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob. But Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. And kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to you. And I will give the land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. <coughs> Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. So Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. So, so we see it, he responds to God, and he does everything he's supposed to, and God then responds in kind. He does, he says, I'm going to bless you, and this is where the first time we see it, he's like, you're going to inherit the promised land. You're going to get that promised land that was guaranteed to Abraham. That one's yours now. You have secured yourself all the blessings I've already set up for Abraham. And, and it sounds like this beautiful story, he's going to be blessed. He's going to have everything going for him, right? And we understand that right now is the perfect time when we have that happy ending and they live happily ever after, right? Man, I love the Bible. 
How many of y'all have ever heard the story of Humpty Dumpty? It's, this story is a lot more like Humpty Dumpty, right? Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put it back together again. I think it's the end of that, just so you know. No, and that is exactly what really happens in this story. What really happens in this story? Jacob does what's right finally. God gives him this promise and he says, it's all going to be beautiful. You're going to have everything I've already promised Abraham. Verse 16. It doesn't work that way. Then they journeyed from Bethel. And then there was still some distance to go to Ephraim. Rachel began to give birth and she suffered severe labor. When she was in severe labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. It came about as her soul was departing before she died, that she named him ben Onai, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar over her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. And then Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. It came about while Israel was dwelling in the land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now these were the twelve sons of Jacob, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, then Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun. The, the sons of Rachel, the sons of Rachel, the sons of Rachel. The sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. And the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maid, Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, who were born to him in Padanar. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre of Kirith Arby, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had journeyed. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac breathed his last and died. And was gathered to his people, an old man of ripe age, and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. So the, the story starts out like any story you would you know, want to write about. You, would, you have this beautiful, he responds to God, God responds to him, he gets this blessing, and then obviously the next thing his wife does. Not just any wife. I mean, we know that he has two wives, two concubines. But Rachel. Not the ugly sister who he didn't really want, but he kind of got because, you know, his father-in-law tricked him or whatever happened there. But this is the, this is the wife that he loves more than anything who, who gave him a favorite son. Who gave him Joseph. And then when she bears Benjamin, she dies. And though it's only one sentence in this, how many of y'all notice that his son goes and sleeps with one of his wives? How many of y'all notice that? It's just, and it happened, he heard about it. Hush, hush. Hush, hush. He doesn't forget it, though. When, he, when he's given the blessing at the end of the life, he makes it very clear he only remembers one thing about that son. You slept with my wife. You will be cursed. Okay. That's the blessing for him. Because he remembers it. And so what happened is you have this perfect walking with God where we're doing everything. We're doing what we think we should be doing. And we're actually trying to serve God. And God's like, when you serve me, there's this blessing to be had. And then all of a sudden, what happens? We, we get on cloud nine and we get perfect and we're walking with the Lord. And we're just loving it. And then what happens? In real life, what happens? Do we stay there? Does anybody ever stay there? If you do, I really just want to hang out with you all the time. I, and it doesn't happen. You don't get to this cloud nine and then just stay there. Real life happens again. He, he's got this spiritual relationship going on. And it's great and it's beautiful. And then all these physical things start happening. His wife dies. 
His favorite wife dies. That one wife, his son sleeps with one of his other wives. Down two wives. Benjamin is born a child of his own age, and she generally curses him with a terrible, wretched name. They don't know. But Jacob takes so much joy in Benjamin that he renames Benjamin. He does. He calls him Benjamin, which is a great name, because in, in, the, in the story of Israel, you're going to find out there's two people that mean a whole lot to their father. The, those sons of the favored wife mean a whole lot to his father. And, and we, know, we know kind of what happens in the future and how it's just going to get worse from here. Right? Because remember, he has two sons that he's really excited about. Joseph and Benjamin. And most of us know Joseph is about to get us into a whole lot of trouble. He's about to die. Right? He's about to, in all sense of Israel's knowledge, he's going to die. And we look at this and we go, who would write this kind of thing? This, this isn't the stuff of stories. This is the stuff of, hey, everyday life. This is stuff where you go and you've gotten into this place with God and you've got everything figured out and you're doing spiritually better than you've ever done before. And then those things, those everyday parts of living on this earth get in the way. And he just got a new name. Then his favorite wife does. He just received a blessing. And then all this terrible stuff starts to happen. And then Isaac dies. And, and, and me, I, I kind of start to think, and you know, I'm kind of comparing it in my head. I am. Mean, I'm going, well, you remember when he ran away from his brother, you know? His daughter gets raped. Terrible. Well, his wife dies, and his other wife sleeps with her, his son. And I'm just kind of torn. He, he's serving God perfectly here, and I see what happens. And then he's serving himself and his fear right here, and I'm seeing what happens. And it's not one of those where we go, you know, all things work for the good of those who Love God and call according to His purpose. Well, it's kind of out of context. It's kind of completely out of context. Because what we've made that say is simply that God's going to do what's going to make you happy. And it doesn't say anything like that. It only says this, they work for good. Ugh. We don't even usually like good. We like good when it benefits us. Yes, we do. We don't like good when it requires me to do, go to a new level of service. We don't like good when it looks like this. We don't like good when this is happening in our lives and we're going, God, I thought you just gave me this great promise. I got rid of all my idols. Come on, give me something. I'll give you something, a dead wife. Whoa. And so, in contrast, I, I honestly, you know, in a very human perspective, I'm just looking at it, comparing it, and going, which was better? Wh which was better? Was it better when he was serving himself, or was it better when he was serving God? Hey, I, I mean, I'm going to just I don't have a daughter, so that just throws me off completely. I mean, it'd be terrible if my wife died, though. And my other wife that she doesn't know about, obviously. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just got off it. Right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm going, 
like many of us do in our lives, and we go, does it really look that much better than to serve God? Does it really work the way that we want it to? Because we want that Snow White story. We want that Cinderella story. Right? We want that, there's a kiss happily ever after. I don't even know which one that was. But we have these princess stories, and that's kind of what we want. And there's nothing like that. Because God doesn't even make those kind of promises. God makes the opposite promises. I, I, I like how everyone comes to Jesus and they're like, you know, you're going to bring peace on the earth. And he's like, I will bring peace in you. He says, I, I didn't come to bring peace, though. I came to bring a sword. Wait, Jesus, that's not really used for peace, just so you know. No, I came to bring a sword. I'm going to divide families. You will be hated by everyone. And you just imagine this big smile at this point. This is what's going to happen. You're going to serve me and be hated by everyone. And if you love anybody more than me, you can't even follow me. And in our modern day, we don't even think about what it was like for them. They pretty much knew their answer. They could do their own thing and it was going to look a whole lot better. They were almost guaranteed it would look better if they did their own thing. Almost a guarantee. And then they knew what would happen if they did it God's way. And I'm glad that they decided that they would just die. I'm glad all the disciples decided to die for the cause. And this story has a pretty obvious application for us. Too often we're convinced that if we serve God, it all goes perfectly, and that's the story we want. And we're like, when then something bad happens, we're like, God, why, why? Why can't we leave it? I've been serving you, I've been doing this. Your response was supposed to be... And we look through scripture and we've got this one verse that we've taken out so far that we're just like all things work together for the good. I'm supposed to be happy. Whoa. And it doesn't fit any of the rest of the context. It doesn't fit with any of the things. Jesus says, you can come up to me and be like me. Thank you, Jesus. Because, you know, when our first thought is, we're like, well, we want to be holy and set apart like Jesus. And he's like, no, you get the whole package. You get that. You know how they persecuted me and hate me? That's what you get. Come follow me. You, you know that whole sacrifice of mine where I give of myself and they spit on me and mock me? Hey, you can be like me. And, and the real Jesus is not our storybook Jesus. And, and the real story Jacob is not our storybook. And our real Christianity that we have to face every day and we have to wake up to, if we have the idea in the first place, we set ourselves up for failure. Well, if I come to God, then everything's going to work out. Nothing bad will ever happen in my life. And there's nothing further from the scripture. He guarantees the opposite. There will be worse things if you follow him. He says, there was this foolish man. And, and he, you know, he started building a house, but he didn't see how much money he had. He stopped halfway through and it floods and destroys the house. Great story. Jesus, he got some dark stories. And, and you get into these parables and you get into this foolish builder and this wise builder and that's the one we really like we like to talk about the one who built his house on the rock and it stood firm and the one who built his house on the sand and it crumbled 
We don't think about the one where he says he didn't count the cost. And it's the same thing offered to us. He doesn't offer us something free. He doesn't charge us to be with him any more than we have. But he does ask us to pay the cost. And he, and he says it very specifically. He says, count the cost before you follow me. He, he's warning them. He's saying that what a waste it is to follow God if you're not ready to follow me when it's not the happy times. When stuff is going bad and everyday life gets in the way of serving God. Because I, I would have thought at this point Jacob was just going to In the middle of this story, I don't know if you noticed, Benjamin. Benjamin is essential to this story. Because of the way Rachel says it. Rachel calls him one thing. And he says no. Rachel says that he is the son, Ben, of Nai, sorrow, son of sorrow. Jacob replaces that with son of the right hand. And, and we see something in this. In the middle of this darkness, we see Jacob, who has just become Israel, doing something that is beautiful. In, in the middle of all kinds of bad things happening, there's still that trust. There's still that faith in God because he's saying, this is the son of my right hand. He's going to be raised up to something great. He's going to be something great. He is the son of my right hand. And, and he didn't succumb to it and go, the world has taken me out and I'm just crumbling. Woe is me, son of sorrow. And, and, and it's our challenge today is when we face Christianity... Do we face Christianity going, I'm going to face bad things? There's going to be hard things in my life. Or do we honestly think, I'm serving God because it's nice right now? Because Jesus is pretty clear, that's pointless. Why did you waste all that time serving me in the first place? Didn't you know that you had been offered two things? You had been offered, follow yourself. It should actually go better for you. Whoa. And then he says, follow me. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And our lives need to be about deciding these things before it happens. Because because we can wait till so, you know we're serving God and everything's high, and then everything goes wrong, and we're like, well, what do we do? Or, or we can think about it ahead of time and be like, God, I'm going to serve you when it is terrible. God, there is nothing you can take from me that I don't love less than you. I, I read a book. I know it's kind of scary. I have to. It's quite. And it was called A Grief Observed. It's all about this man's wife dying. And he just writes about what it feels like. But he knew his wife was dying. When he married her, she had cancer. She was already dying. And it was pretty much prescribed she's going to die sometime. And, and instead of waiting until she's already died, and then let's deal with it, he's like, okay, I'm going to write another book. It's a book right And he writes a book about the problem of pain to prepare himself for when his wife dies. And, and I know that we don't know what specific evils are going to come in our lives. But if we look at it and we say, God, I love you more than. And we just go down the list. I love you more than my wife. She dies tomorrow. Okay. She gets sick. Okay. My son, I, I love you more than my son. He dies tomorrow. He gets sick. I 
They die together. I love you more than that. And, and when we look at it and we say, God, there's nothing that I don't love more than you. And instead of waiting for something bad to happen, just be ready to say, God, I love you more. Job had to do it. And Job was ready to say that he loved God more. In every trial he went through, he continued to say, I love you, God, more than this. Whether there was physical problems, whether he lost all his wealth, whether his wife was telling him to curse God and die, the rest of his family is dying. The wife got to stay around so she could say that. And he's ready to say that he loves God more than that. And when we talk about Christianity, that's, that's, we need to be ready to go to that sorrowful place. Where we say, God, I don't like what you said, Jesus. And we shouldn't. We're not, we shouldn't naturally go to it and say, well, I like my life so, wife so little that I just don't care. I'm supposed to love my wife. But, but I should understand when he says that if I don't hate them in comparison to him, I, I can't even follow him in the first place. Because all I'm going to have to do is take out my wife and I'm done. I didn't count the cost. I ran after God when it was easy and then he took what was hardest in my life and I wasn't ready to say, God, I love you more than that. Titus ends this way. Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we had done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewing, and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We, we still have that promise, and, and you know, we're looking at this very physical, and I want to make sure we end ignoring the physical for a second and saying, we're right. When we're comparing apples to oranges and we're going, well, it looks like it wound up better when he served himself. And it would have been worse if he served God. And you want to look at this life, you're right. That's the kind of stuff that Jesus promises us. And the great thing is, Jesus isn't that concerned with this life. It makes sense because he understands time. I understand that five seconds is not the same as two hours. We forget this. We forget that a hundred years is nothing like eternity. Amen. And when we talk about eternity, this is where he makes his promises. This is where he says, here's the good stuff you were waiting on. Made heirs according to the hope of eternal. What kind of life? Eternal. So tonight we offer an invitation and that is eternal life. Not a life where it's great on this earth, but in a life where it is eternally good. And if there is anyone who has not put their faith in Christ, knowing that He is Lord, confess Him as that Lord. Repent, knowing that none of our righteousness is good enough. None of our deeds is good enough, but only giving it all to God and being sorrowful that we've done these things. Being baptized into Him where He washes us and we just allow Him to work. So that then we can live this life and remain faithful so that when it comes to death, we can have the hope of eternal life. If there's anybody who hasn't done that, that invitation is open tonight. If anybody wishes to submit to the eldership here, or if anybody needs prayers, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing. Uh,
I have decided to follow. 